And I'm going to try being bang on time for once. Hello, good evening. Welcome to episode 15 of Shelf Analysis. I know, I thought we'd do a few of these. We'd knock out five or six of them. It'd be fantastic fun. Everything would go back to what we laughingly called normal. And now all of a sudden, I, I, I today sent out a series of emails to book this right the way through to the end of May which is where we are with this right now. Uh, if it's your first time uh, viewing the live uh, show in the Ricochet Book Club, how are you? It has just gone seven o'clock, it's a Monday night, and this is Shelf Analysis, three episodes this week. Our author tonight is uh, Irish with a debut novel, with an exceptional debut novel. Uh, Wednesday night, we are going to the United States, and Thursday, we are going to Scotland all things being well and all things being equal. A couple of things to let you know about um, as we uh, get on with this tonight. Where am I gonna go? I'm gonna press all these buttons here. So all of those things happening, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday. Then I have mentioned this before, but it's due to mention again because uh, it's getting a fair amount of coverage over the course of the last few days. This coming Friday night as part of the virtual Kurch Festival, uh, I'm gonna be talking live to Anne Enright. That's at 7.30 as part of Kurch this coming Friday night. Like many of us, I was due to be physically in actual Kurch uh, this weekend uh, coming, but uh, uh, obviously things have changed. Having said that, there are some incredible events that are happening as part of that. If you want to go and have a look, it's kurch.ie, C-U-I-R-T, kurch.ie, and they have a bunch of events happening across the course of the weekend. Best thing, of course, is that they are all entirely free, and you just need to go have a look and register yourself for them. Stick yourself in the diary and make sure you know what's going on. Also, uh, thank you to everybody who had lovely things to say about... The book show, the book show came back yesterday to RTE Radio 1. We're back for six episodes. Uh, yesterday's one, I spoke to Derek Landy about the 13th, 13th book in the Skullduggery Pleasant series, um, amongst other things, and about his inability to write at the moment because of where we all are. Um, I also had Anne Enright talking to a uh, book club in Navin in County Mead as well. They asked her some fantastic, exceptional questions. Well done to the book club in Navin uh, that we had on. Uh, you can find it wherever you find your podcasts. Just look up RTE Book Show. Uh, you'll find it there. One of the things that I got most out of it was um, at the very beginning, I was talking to Anne Enright, as I am to all of the authors we do here on Shelf Analysis, and just asking how you're dealing with at the moment, uh, dealing with everything at the moment. And I think she had the best answer that I've gotten so far from anyone, which is I'm just cutting everybody a lot of slack. I think that as a piece of advice goes a very, very, very long way at the moment. That's that covered. That's that covered. I'm gonna go down here. Oh yeah, one more one more very brief mention for everybody who's not physically in the Ricochet Book Club, if you're not on Facebook maybe, or you're just not a member, uh, I did set up a YouTube channel. It's now there, all of the interviews are uploaded after they happen, you'll be able to find them in the YouTube channel. Uh, there's no wonderful youtube.com slash ricochet URL. You have to wait for a month to get one of these. Who knew? I'm learning all sorts of new things every day. Uh, but we will have one of those uh, soon at the moment if you want to find out where the YouTube channel is. There's details in the announcements section here in the Ricochet Book Club. Also, uh, you'll find it pinned as a post uh, to my Twitter account as well if you go and have a look there. Uh, and all of the previous episodes are there for people who aren't members of Facebook or aren't members of the Ricochet Book Club. Uh, last plug, there's tons happening tonight. On Monday, always seems things are happening over the course of the weekend. This is very much worth your time. You probably know that Tati, Christine Dwarhickey's book, is One City, One Book this year. Uh, and at the moment, RTE Culture and One City, One Book uh, have the incredible Shauna Kerslake reading excerpts from Tati, which is One City, One Book this year. They were again as part of that due to be lots of events happening uh, all the way across Dublin City. Uh, so maybe as a, as a small um, consolation, you can get to hear Shona Kerslake reading part of Christine Dwarhickey's Tatty, which is One City, One Book. That's over on the RTE Culture homepage, easy enough to find rte.ie forward slash culture. Uh, it is, of course, uh, Read Irish Women Month as well. Let me get myself in here and get myself out of here. The Read Irish Women Challenge 2020 continues. Today is the 20th of the month, a book for a blue day, a comfort read. Um, the books for the Read Irish Women Challenge across the course of the month, the ones that are being chosen for us here, are of course being chosen by our guest star every night, Karina the Houseplant. Karina the Houseplant is reading. Hi, Karina, how are you doing? Good? Yeah, okay. I, I realize that's all I get from you every night, but at the moment, any kind of contact from any other sentient being is, is, is helpful. Um, I want to say uh, hi to everybody who has only lovely things to say about Karina and Karina's book choices, because let's be honest, 
you're the real star of the show and your choices have been exceptional so far. Uh, your choices room a little darker. Okay, in terms of, yeah. Uh, Natterbean, uh, your suggestion was that that's probably one of the funnier ones. And I like Leitrim Flip. I think Leitrim Flip is an exceptionally funny story in it. Other people see it as being slightly darker. If you haven't read um, Jim Caldwell's Room a Little Darker, um, that's a that's a top notch book to get a, to get your uh, reading gear around at the moment. Karina, thank you. Go back to the reading. Enjoy yourself. Have a lovely evening. Thanks. Um, before we get to our guest tonight, which we will do uh, in a minute, uh, I, I've been recommending books over the course of this myself, just giving you something that you know might incite you, and particularly everybody who's experiencing um, writers and readers block at the moment, in particular readers block. I've had it. I realized that I read 20, I listed it today somewhere online, 22, 23 books before this all started this year. I have read one since. I have finished a single book in the last four weeks, which if you know me, is, is it's, I may as well be in a coma, frankly. So I finished one, uh, which we've spoken about here before. I have now pretty much just finished the second one, although I've been getting through the last, and it, it is no, uh, it is nothing to do with this book that it has taken me so long to read it because it is exceptional and I want to put it in your hands and I want you to read it if you get the chance. It is, and you'll have heard people rattling on about this everywhere, and rightly so, Maggie O'Farrell's wonderful Hamnet. It is her version of the story of the son of William Shakespeare, the one who dies when he's a young boy and the influences that he has in the lives of everybody around him. Mainly the story isn't about William Shakespeare at all. In fact, he's not named in it. He's one of the relatively minor characters. It's more about his uh, mother and his sisters and his family and the life that exists for them uh, in Stratford. It is a beautifully written, beautifully put together book. It may make you weep a little in places. That's perfectly fine and acceptable in these strange times. Um, and can I say it? I, I'm very, I'm almost very cautious about not mentioning things and I'm not talking about who's going to be coming up on, on the show over the course of future weeks. I can tell you that I have spoken to Maggie O'Farrell already. She's going to be on a future episode of the book show on Radio 1. And at some point in the next few weeks, she will be one of our guests here on Shelf Analysis as well. No, I'm not going to tell you when. You'll just have to get in every single night. Are we done? I think we're done. Okay, fine. Um, my guest tonight is an Irish author who normally lives in the UK, but is uh, in Ireland at the moment. Um, you may have seen a ton of stuff about her over the course of the last week, two weeks, and particularly over the weekend in a lot of newspapers and a lot of reviews about the book, uh, which is genuinely one of my favorite Irish debuts in years. It is one I've mentioned here on the show before already. Uh, it is one you'll find out tons about already elsewhere, regardless of wherever you are. Uh, welcome, Nisha Dolan. How are you? I'm good. Um, <laughs> hard to say anything that lives up to an intro like that, I guess. But yeah. that, that's okay. I, I, I wanted to completely throw you by doing that introduction like that. But genuinely, it's it's it's. Um, tell me a little bit about it. it's always the first question for for every author I have on because everyone is in a slightly different situation where they are. Everyone has lived through a slightly different last three weeks, four weeks, whatever. Uh, how has it been for you in the last few weeks? Um, pretty good. I think I'm bad at screening out what's happening more broadly around me, so that's been hard. But in terms of what's actually in front of me in my own situation, it's been pretty fine because I'm a fairly low-key person anyway, so I don't really need constant stimulation. And I've also actually had way more of it than I'm used to with the book happening to come out. So, uh, yeah, I'm doing as well as anyone can, I think. Tell me a little bit, maybe, if you don't mind, about your surrounds as well, because everybody's got something slightly different going on. Where are you? Yeah, I'm staying in my parents' house in South Dublin, and we're just beside Bushy Park, so that's nice. can go for a nice walk. And you've got what, what it seems like an extensive bookshelf. Is that yours, or is that somebody else's? Is that is that what's going on there? Oh, yeah. Um, so this is my teen bedroom. So um, books pretty much everywhere. It's the only place that I have to keep them. I haven't had a permanent living situation in quite a while. So, yeah, they just stack up here, really. Um, people may have seen, again, there were a lot of every Sunday newspaper I opened at the weekend had something about the book in it as well. And they have done for, for, for quite a while. Tell me a little bit for those people who haven't seen anything about the book, about exciting times. Maybe tell us about the book. Sure. So 
if I have one sentence to describe it, I'd call it a love triangle set in expat Hong Kong. Since I have more sentences, it's not a love triangle at all. It's about a young Irish woman who goes abroad to teach English and finds herself in two relationships. The first is with Julian, who's a detached rye British banker, and then a second relationship while he's away with a Hong Konger called Edith, who's a lawyer and has a bit more zest for life. And so um, the protagonist finds herself choosing between these two people and the modes of being that are kind of wrapped up in them. I, I wanted to ask him from a purely selfish standpoint, why Hong Kong? Mainly because I, I was there last year for the first time. So in the sections of the book that I was reading uh, where, you know, you're describing Hong Kong, I was immediately transported back to like the mid-level escalators. And so I immediately felt like I was back there. Why Hong Kong? Yeah, so I think that's an interesting one because I've done a lot of literary academia stuff. So I'm used to coming up with like the most hyper intellectual answer I can to questions like that. But at the time, it really was just that I liked Hong Kong. And so I wanted to set something there rather than dwelling in some less favoured city. But then looking back, obviously, once you choose something about a novel, then when you write it, everything else has to make sense around that thing. So I can say now, oh, well, Hong Kong is a great place to bring out those themes of language or Hong Kong um, really aligns with the following mode of relationship. or whatever. But like if I said it somewhere else, then that wouldn't have happened. So it only makes sense after the fact. You can reverse engineer that as much as you want, and that's a, that's a, that's a perfectly acceptable thing to do as well. Um, the the uh, again, I've talked to maybe four or five authors as part of this uh, series who had books that were due to come out now or at some point in the next next week or two. You, you're one of those. In theory, your book should be you know adorning um, book stores everywhere, and you know you, there should be launches. There should be all sort of glitz and all that happening. How are you feeling about? the way the book has come out now because you know there's a lot of work years of work that goes into where you are right now um to be honest I'm pretty chill about it and you don't want to sound unsympathetic like I'm really sorry for all my friends who are disappointed but I think first of all I'm quite unceremonial as a person so like I never throw myself a birthday party or any of that so things like a book launch party were only ever going to be for the benefit of my parents not for me um, but also I guess it's different if you haven't been immersed in the literary scene for years and years, seeing this happening to your friends and thinking maybe someday I'll get that day as well, because that's not really me at all. I just wrote the book on my own and I'm only really finding myself meeting writers now in the context of already being one. So I guess it's different too if it's been your dream for years and years. So, you know, I feel for people who are missing all that, but I'm lucky, I guess, that I don't do as much to compare it to. So I'm just enjoying this. Was that one of the things that, that I presume was planned over the course of the, the, the summer and, and autumn and stuff is that you were going to be at festivals left, right and centre? Again, because you've never really done that before, was that something you were looking forward to or was that something that you were just going, OK, that's that's part of the job now that the book is out? Yeah, like, I think possibly some of this is generational and some of it is that I'm autistic, but um, doing stuff on the internet feels real to me. You know, when I see people responding to things on Twitter, I don't feel that sense of like, oh, but I don't get to shake hands with them. And I can't say whether an holistic person my age would feel the same way, but the internet isn't this fake space to me. It's as real a way of socialising as any other. It's it's strange in that as somebody who does interviews, you know, in front of rooms full of people at festivals all the time, you know, the number of people who are watching this now is probably 10 to 15 times the amount of people you would ever have in a room listening to you and I talk about this kind of thing. So so automatically it, it's, 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 it's a far wider um, audience. Yeah. And I think as well, as a disabled author myself, I'm really glad that there's that accessibility element coming out. You know, in terms of disability, in terms of money, in terms of not living in a big city, I think this is making literature way more accessible to loads of people who might never have been able to go to those festivals or never would have thought of going. And it's not as bad in Ireland. Like in Ireland, I think you do get a broader range of people engaging in traditional events than somewhere like the UK, where it really is bound up with a lot of religious connotations. But it's still really nice to have your work out there in ways that are accessible to people like you. Because frankly, I never used to go to those things before I had a book out myself. So there was that element of finding it a bit alien that suddenly I was doing these things associated to a community I had never before belonged to, you know? So it's nice having it out there in a way that passed me two or three years ago would have found accessible myself. Okay, well then I, I'm glad we're doing this. We're going to move from your book to what is 
in theory, the reason we do this, although it's a load of nonsense just to get to talk to authors I want to talk to, um, three books from your own shelves that you think people uh, should read. Uh, I don't give people criteria, so you can pick anything you want from any period of your life that can be old, new, doesn't matter. What have you chosen tonight for book number one? So, um, I'll start with Queenie because I think this is one of these books that absolutely everyone needs to read because whatever level you like to read books on, it's there, like it's compellingly paced, the characters are people you want to spend time with. So if you just want to sink your teeth into someone else's lives and all you want is an existence that isn't yours for a bit, which is fair because they're not under quarantine, so that's great. Um, it's great on that level. But if you want to read a bit more slowly or take in a bit more of the context, it's also got some really interesting things to say about what it's like to be a young black woman in London now or London <laughs> up until coronavirus. So, um, and there is so many shades in between of how you can read it. So I think it's one of those things where you can bring into it as much analytical depth as you want and it'll satisfy you on any level pretty much. So yeah, Queenie, pretty great. Um, then an Irish pick, Shed a Good Time by Nicole Flattery. So, Definitely a darker sense of humour with these. It's a collection of her short stories. If you keep up with Irish journals and things, I'm sure you've seen her work around. I'm sure a lot of people have read this already, but um, she's incredibly funny with just this deadpan style that I've never heard her read her work actually. And I'd be really curious to hear how she read it because I hear these in a very flat voice, but then equally the prose is really inventive. So yeah, it's another one of those ones that you can kind of do a range of things when you're interpreting it. Then, I, I did an event with uh, with her and Emily Pine at the Still Writers Week last year. And again, for me, it was strange to hear her read her own work. And the audience almost found humor in places in which I might not necessarily have found it in the first place, but, but people who were there did. And it was one of the stranger rooms I've done one of these in in, in the Stole. It was full of, uh, it's in the hotel in the Stole. They had to open up an extra room because so many people wanted to do it. There were quite a lot of uh, older readers who were there. They were all kind of having tea and scones. It was the middle of the morning. It was kind of a strange place for both Emily and for Nicole to be, to, to be reading their work. But they seemed to find different things in it than I thought they might. Yeah, that is one thing actually that I'm missing out on that I'd be curious to see when this all passes, that element of audience response and how you read out your work, because I've never done that really, maybe once or twice over the course of many years. So my sense is that some jokes get more traction with people around you just because that element of collective shock and like what do we do with this maybe <laughs> makes some of the blacker humour either more or less funny, just depending on how it's delivered. So. I think, as Ruth Gilligan said in, in an earlier episode of this, that you know, books aren't like milk. You know, they don't have a shelf life. They're not going to go off. So ultimately, you know, when when all of this, like we keep using the phrase, when all of this changes and when all of this goes back to whatever, you know, th that experience um, will, will happen. Third book, what have you chosen? Third book, um, the Prezian by Isabel Hamad. Um, I think this is a really interesting one for Irish people because we're so interested in the Palestinian cause and see a lot of historical commonality. But um, this is a historical novel set back before the period that we're used to considering. Um, it follows the protagonist as he goes to study medicine in France and finds himself embroiled in World War One. And I think it's just interesting sometimes to consider things from perspectives where we don't have as much of a ready-made opinion. So for obvious reasons with the setting, this doesn't invade directly on the conflict now. And I think that's an amount of nuance that's important to bring to things sometimes, especially if we have a preordained lens that we normally apply to it. And it's also just a brilliant book. So I don't think going in with a hyper academic answer, like it's also just a really rich historical read and the setting's great. It's also very funny, very observant, and it's a touching love story. Yeah, I've got two questions, one of which comes from uh, somebody in the in the book. There's more than one person commenting uh, on, on, uh, on the live stream at the moment, wanting to know what all of the turned books on your bookshelf are. Now, oh. do you know? Is there a reason for that? Is there or oh, that's just the way they are? Um, I think some of it was aesthetic because I get really stressed out when backgrounds are really busy. So. <laughs> No, but probably there wasn't too much rhyme or reason to it. Um, I'd be scared to try to upturn them now because I think the whole thing might collapse. 
it's probably best not to do that on a, on a live broadcast on the internet. That's that's not, that's not a good way to go. Um, yeah. uh, we, they're, Geraldine... they're likely to be um, cheap Victorian ones just because that's what I got the most in my teens because they were a Euro to pop. But mm. who knows? Could that makes honest. sense. Cheap science fiction. That, that was what happened with me as well. Same thing. Um, Ger Geraldine wants to know, could you just hold up the last book again? She wants to have a look at the cover of the, the Parisian, maybe of the last one again. Yeah, it's I, a fantastic cover, isn't it? It's beautiful. Yeah. Um, and again, maybe people can, can check that as well. What we do as well in the comments below, we'll put all of the details of all of the, the books that Nisha has picked as well. Geraldine from the Dromineer Nina Literary Festival says, hello, I'm just passing that on. It's come in comments, okay. Uh, Gay says, uh, I heard Nisha speak to Brendan O'Connor uh, yesterday. She was most engaging, really enjoyed it. Um, and I know we probably shouldn't say this, although I only just found this out earlier, but you're gonna be on a future episode of the book show with me as well uh, in a few weeks on Radio One um, as well. Um, a, a question from a fellow author. This is this could go one of two ways. Uh, the wonderful Keelan Hughes uh, says, "Do you write?" Keelan says, "Do you write short stories too, or is it always novels?" Um, I think it's always a novel in my head, but sometimes if it turns out it's not a novel, then it becomes a short story. So, because um, Keelan, I know you worked on poetry primarily, didn't you? And then um, wrote a novel, and I. I think I read a chapter of your novel a while back, but sorry, this is me like talking to Keelan in front of a bunch of other people. But you go ahead, you fire, fire ahead. Yeah, go. I, yeah, I think I started Keelan's novel at a point where I didn't have the brain to read anything. And I was like, I love this, but I need to put it down for a bit because my brain is wasps. But anyway, I got the sense from that, that that sense of poetic selection was really informing everything like there was so much packed into every sentence whereas I think I'm a lot more of a slow burner kind of writer mm -hmm. in my way but yeah on my right short story sometimes I think I end up doing it accidentally as opposed to viewing it as my ideal form but I think that's because novels are most of what I read and so that's the shape that presents itself to me most readily, like when I think of a story, that's just how it starts to talk about. Uh, for, for those people who maybe uh, don't know Keelan's uh, new book, The Wild Laughter, is it's been bumped ever so slightly, but it is coming out later on in the summer. And I couldn't possibly say whether or not she's going to be a future guest on the show in the next few weeks. I couldn't possibly say that. Um, we've got questions, questions, questions. Um, there's you know, one more as well. So, uh, Brenda says, uh, Nisha, you seem lovely which is always nice to know on, an, on, a, on a, something like this. Uh, I can't wait to read Exciting Times. Um, could be very suitable for book clubs. Would you recommend it for us? Um, well, I have to, don't I? <laughs> that was awful. I've heard that the author is just a complete wagon of void. Yeah, it's been terrible. She was on, she recommended books that, you know, I didn't like the look of, and then that was it, we were done. I I, I, I know we're just pretty much finished and, and we're done here, but um, I'm, I'm conscious as well of how, how weird and awkward this must be doing this in your, your teenage bedroom uh, in a situation that's probably very different than where you would normally be doing this if you were, because you, you live in, in the UK. Uh, what's ish. your I don't ish really sort of? Thing, so. Okay. <laughs> And what's your, your, your writing space like normally? Because I know that's something that people are, are usually fascinated with. Or do you have one? Are you one of those people that can pretty much write anywhere? Yeah, um, I think this might also be a generational thing, but then it also might not because I know people in the 20s who are very different about this. But I don't need anything physical around me. It's all just on my laptop. And if someone gives me a physical form of notes, I'm like, can you please give me this in a document or I will just lose it? So yeah pretty much anywhere um i am going to put up one more time sorry here we go again because i'm directing my own show as well at the same time there you go the book is exciting times gorgeous cover design as well and a really simple wonderful arresting cover design as well did you have any say in that or was that just just put to you um it was put to me and i really liked it i think usually authors have negative say in the cover but um in terms of like going i would like the following on it not so much but and again, maybe if I were a more forceful person and I come to them with an idea, they would have gone with it. But I'm very happy with the one they came up with, for sure. I, yeah, I think it all worked out well in the end. Um, thank you so much for talking to us tonight uh, on Shelf Analysis, Nisha. I will talk to you soon over the next couple of weeks on the book show as well, on uh, Radio 1 as well. And thanks a million for, for coming on tonight. Thank you, Vic. That was Nisha Dunn. Nisha is the author, of course, of... Uh, um,
the of exciting times apologies again now that she's gone i can say the really nice things about exciting times which primarily are that it's a it's one of the best irish debut novels that i've read in forever and i enjoyed it immensely and if i had the brain space right now i was capable of reading anything i would be reading as well uh, that's it we're done for tonight pretty much um next episode is on wednesday night wednesday night is going to be interesting we are going to the united states on wednesday night and again thursday night we are going to scotland for again what i think is going to be quite an extraordinary episode uh, on thursday night as well if you want to check out any of the previous episodes they are in the announcement section here in the ricochet book club some of them are archived by our friends at rte culture and you'll also find all of them on the brand new youtube channel for those people who aren't uh, on Facebook. And again, the link to that best way to go until we get a better way of doing this, the best way to go is find uh, the pinned post at the top of my Twitter account. You go and look and find Rikashi on Twitter. Uh, other than that, that's it. Have yourself a brilliant, fantastic next couple of days. Catch you on RT Gold at 10 a.m. Uh, tomorrow morning and every morning this week. I'm back here again Wednesday night in the Ricochet Book Club at uh, 7 o'clock. See you then.